A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 19, Part 4, Origins of the Vietnam Quagmire. Just as the space race had its roots in concerns over Soviet ability to strike the United States with atomic weapons, so too did the disaster in Southeast Asia known as the Vietnam War. As he does for Soviet space supremacy, Eisenhower bears much of the blame for failing to address the problems in Vietnam. He failed to lead decisively in the 1954 accords that ended the French presence in Vietnam, by which time America already was paying 80% of the French effort there. The communist boss from the North, Ho Chi Minh, or He Who Shines, had received extensive support from the U.S. wartime spy agency, the OSS, forerunner to the Central Intelligence Agency. By 1954, most analysts agreed open and fair elections throughout the whole of Vietnam would have placed Ho in power. An unacceptable outcome to most Cold War State Department officials. It is also true, however, that when the partition did take place, some 900,000 residents of the North decided to escape the blessings of enlightenment offered by the new communist regime and headed south. Eisenhower helped entrench the view that Vietnam's fall might topple other dominoes in the region. History proved Eisenhower partially correct in this regard. After South Vietnam fell, Cambodia and Laos soon followed. But then the dominoes stopped falling for a number of reasons, including the split between China and the Soviet Union that turned off the funding faucet to the North's regime. Meanwhile, even with the scant attention the United States had paid to Vietnam under Eisenhower, the country made progress under its premier, Ngo Dinh Nhiem, a French-educated Catholic in a primarily Buddhist nation. Advances were so rapid that after a visit to the South in 1958, North Vietnamese Commissar Liu Don returned with alarming news that conditions in the South were improving at such a pace that in the near future, insufficient sentiment for a communist revolution would exist. Here was the communist bottom line. Their cause was only advanced out of misery, and when average people improved their lot, communism came out a loser. To ensure the progress stopped, Viet Cong, or VC, guerrillas assassinated government disease control squads sent out to spray malarial swamps. They killed doctors traveling away from their hospitals en route to the villages and killed pro-government village chiefs after hacking off the arms of their children, displaying all the impaled heads on stakes outside the village as a warning to the others. Eisenhower had utterly failed to equip and support the interior defense forces in the South. Kennedy, however, wanted to establish the image of a young cold warrior he promised in his inaugural address that the United States would pay any price and bear any burden in the cause of liberty. After failing to support the Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy could not afford another foreign policy flop. More than any other 20th century president before him, JFK paid attention to propaganda and world opinion. He increased the funding and authority of the U.S. Information Agency actively challenging foreign governments by market research and advertising. His Peace Corps fought communism with shovels and spades instead of guns. Kennedy's appraisal of communism was not an issue. Even after the Cuban Missile Crisis, questions remained about whether he and America had the patience to stay the course in a conflict involving international communism. The first threat in Southeast Asia had come in Laos, where again Eisenhower's failure to commit troops had sealed the country's fate. Kennedy had to negotiate, leading one of the communist leaders of North Vietnam to note approvingly that the American government has fallen entirely within the scope of communist strategy in Laos. That left Vietnam, and Kennedy made clear he would not abandon this domino. When, after the disastrous decade-long Vietnam War resulted in public criticism and assignment of responsibility, Kennedy should have been at the top of the blame list. 
why he was not is itself an interesting twist in American history. Just as in later years, writers and historians would ascribe to JFK a zeal to rectify economic and racial disparities that he had never displayed while alive, so too they would later seek to insulate him from criticism over his Vietnam War policy. John Roche, a special consultant to Lyndon Johnson and an advisor to Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey, recalled that the revival of Kennedy's Vietnam record began in 1965-66 by a group Roach labeled the Jacobites. As Roach recalled, odd stories surfaced. Jack Kennedy had whispered to speechwriter Kenny O'Donnell that once he was reelected in 1964, he'd get out of Vietnam. The point of all these tales was that Johnson had betrayed the Kennedy trust, had gone off on a crazy Texas-style military adventure. An alternative history, having JFK withdraw from Vietnam right after his re-election, has appeared, and some have argued that his strong stance prior to the election was a deception. Whether Kennedy planned to follow through on his deception or whether he ever intended to withdraw from Vietnam remains a matter of high controversy, with two recent books vigorously arguing that JFK would have withdrawn. The evidence, however, paints a much different picture. After JFK's elections, American liberals running the war emphasized winning the hearts and minds of the people through material prosperity and general progress. But such progress depended on a climate of security, which Vietnam did not possess. The VC were not impressed, and without American or Arvin Army of the Republic of Vietnam troops actually present full-time to protect villages, Locals swung their allegiance to their only alternative for survival, the Viet Cong. No president did more to ensure the quagmire of Vietnam than John Kennedy. Fully briefed by Eisenhower even before the election of 1960, JFK had been informed that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had already estimated that 40,000 American soldiers would be needed to combat the estimated 17,000 Viet Cong rebels. If the North Vietnamese got involved, the Joint Chiefs warned it would take three times that many men. Kennedy was the first to order U.S. military troops into Vietnam, not merely CIA advisors. When he secretly dispatched 500 Green Beret, a new unit of highly trained counterinsurgency soldiers that Kennedy had also formed. Into Southeast Asia. He had escalated the buildup of American forces faster than any other president, so that by 1963, almost 17,000 U.S. military forces were stationed in South Vietnam, augmented by American helicopters and countless naval units not included in the official commitment levels. At his final press conference, Kennedy said, for us to withdraw would mean a collapse, not only of South Vietnam, but Southeast Asia. So we're going to stay there. All his principal military advisors favored not only remaining, but also increasing the U.S. commitment. Only the Kennedy image machine spun the notion that Vietnam wasn't Jack's fault. The commitment to Vietnam involved more than military forces. Kennedy and his advisors had come to the conclusion that they could not effectively control South Vietnamese Premier Diem, who had received sharp Western press criticism for persecuting Buddhists. Far from being the Jefferson of Asia, Diem had engaged in a number of distasteful practices. The extent of Diem's anti-Buddhist policy remains in dispute, but little doubt exists that he oppressed Buddhist leaders. Kennedy worried less about the actual oppression and more about public relations images. By 1963, he was looking for an opportunity to replace Diem with someone more tolerant and malleable, so the United States quietly began searching for South Vietnamese generals who would perform a coup. On November 2, 1963, with full support of the United States and using cash supplied by the CIA, South Vietnamese generals overthrew Diem. Coup ringleader Dong Van Min, or Big Min, no relation to Ho, described by anti-Diem American reporters as 
a deceptively gentle man, who, when he spoke of the coup d'etat that lifted him into office, had a discernible tone of apology in his voice, nevertheless managed to make sure that Diem and his brother were shot and knifed several times en route to their exile, having given the pair assurances they would be allowed to live. Despite the administration's support of the coup, Kennedy expressed shock that Diem had been assassinated, having fooled himself into thinking that America could topple a regime in a third world country and expect the participants to behave as though they were in Harvard Yard. Meanwhile, the leader of the Viet Cong called Diem's assassination a gift from heaven to us. It wasn't the only gift the United States would hand Ho. Kennedy's Secretary of Defense and former Ford Executive Robert McNamara arrived in Washington with a long record of mastering statistics for his own purposes. In World War II, he and other whiz kids had put their talents to great use, calculating the most efficient use of bombing by doing target analysis. After the war, McNamara had used his facility with statistics to win almost every internal debate at Ford. Kennedy and McNamara rapidly moved to isolate and weaken the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Often, the JCS did not receive reports critical of the war effort or even objective briefings because of direct intervention by the Secretary of Defense, the President, or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. By the time of the Kennedy assassination, the military had to a great extent been cut out of all substantive planning for a war it was expected to fight and win, and JCS policy recommendations were in disarray because each service branch sought to take the lead in the Vietnam conflict and often refused to support the recommendations of the other branches. All of these issues were largely obscured by the confused and tragic nature of the events in Dallas in November 1963, less than a month after Diem's assassination. And we'll go on with Crime of the Century in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.